Mike Blomberg, MC. It's good to have you with us today. Thank you. Introducing a lot of the tribal elders in the ADSO community to everyone at large. Um, I guess where we should start is that people really would like to know a little bit about who Mike Von Berg is. I know you grew up in country near South Wales. Do you want to share a little bit of the story uh, there? Um, firstly, born in Germany and uh, immigrated here in 1949. And as you can imagine, um, arriving here at that time as a German little kraut kid that couldn't speak English, life was tough in an Irish Catholic school. And uh, You could imagine that, couldn't yeah, you? Yeah, you learn to look after yourself a bit. Yeah. But, uh, no, New South Wales country, uh, Wagga, and, uh, you know, Wagga's a great place in terms of uh, bringing up kids. It certainly was in those days. And uh, lots of sport, lots of fun, lots of mischief. And uh, and also um, seeing a little bit of the army too because of Kapuka at that time as well, especially with national service there in the 50s. I couldn't imagine you being a mischievous child, knowing you're uh, the way that I know you now, Mike. Um, I, have been known to get into trouble, yes. Yep. Yes, yep. no problem. Yep. Any any person I'd ever served with <laughs> would confirm that. <laughs> would confirm that. Are there any tales you'd like to share with us of getting into oh, strife no. as a kid? No. Oh, look, you know, just pinching fruit as you do over the backyards in those days and shooting neighbours' pigeons off the roof and just harmless, harmless stuff. Air know. guns or 22s? Uh, well, the Fork, Fork 70 uh, air guns and 22s and shotguns, uh, 12 gauge, 410s. Kids in the country learned to shoot at a very young age. Totally different time then with the way that society yep. viewed the yep. upbringing of kids. Absolutely. That'd be fair to say. Absolutely. Yep. And in those days too, I mean, there wasn't the sort of money around. Uh, we didn't have the power of communication that we have today. And you really had to make your own fun, you know. I mean, and a lot of fun was mischievous fun. I mean, <laughs> kids today, they, they, they say that's come over and play cricket and they're getting the wee out. Yes. I mean, they've forgotten what fresh air really is, I think, exactly. a lot of kids today. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm still very much involved in rugby. And as a coach, I'm still a level three coach. And um, and I, I just, uh, I think a coach's role is not just about teaching rugby. It's also a bit of a life coach. And, uh, and I'm just delighted to see some of the young people that I've worked with over the years develop to fantastic human beings, but also not just through me, but just the whole mix of family and rugby and club life, etc. to see them develop into really good, solid citizens. I think both the military and sport teach you how to be a part of, oh, yeah. one, a team, but society more at large. Very much so, very much so. Yeah. So you, you obviously went to school in Wagga, but yeah. life didn't keep you in Wagga, you moved on uh, at no, some point we, to Sydney, we, I believe? Uh, we, uh, we went to Sydney in um, around about 1959 and um, I started accounting purely through um, parental pressure, you know, as either law or a, an accountant and law for me was pretty boring because at that time I hated history and principally because it was Australian history. I like ancient history and modern history, not necessarily at that time Australian history. But uh, now, of course, I'm passionate about Australian history. You know, there's so much of it out there if you look for it. But in my time, I just found history boring. So for me, immediately, law would be boring, looking at all the books for precedents, <laughs> etc. So it was numbers, you know, basic numbers and accounting. So I did two years. Well, numbers is where the money is. Well, it's, it's where the numbers uh, were, but at my time they weren't. Four pound thirteen and three a week, <laughs> <laughs> and having to wear a hat to work, not exciting. Uh, Four pound thirteen, like a lot of lot of wide gents today probably wouldn't to bucks, really know. Ten, ten dollars a week. Yeah, ten what, bucks a week. What was the average wage in comparison to that? Oh, I mean, I was indentured, so the average wage then would have been probably around about fifteen, something yep. like that. Yep. So as an apprentice, it's yeah, yeah, similar yeah, today. Just, yeah. You know, and, and yeah. in those days it was an honour or an honour and a relief to be indentured in some way and so therefore you did a lot of hard work for a little, a little money but also it taught you some basic values as well. It was positioning in society too, yeah. being, being indentured as an accountant I'd yeah. imagine. Oh yeah, in those days it was sort of considered that uh, you know you were one step a bit above the others uh, but uh, overall um, accounting can be exciting 
but it can also be bloody Gee, you, boring. You, I've got to say, you'll have to explain <laughs> that one to most people, I think. <laughs> uh, well, you know, forensic accounting, I think, today um, is, is, is fascinating. Um, you know, the movement of money and, and you know, little, little things in the balance sheet sheets that uh, people that are astute can see where others can't. But just adding up the Qantas uh, stamp account uh, as part of audit, uh, two and a half pence, one and a half pence, is not exciting, I can tell you. I think I know from my background with what I do these days that specialisation in particular areas really becomes passionate for people. Oh, and yes. You do get excited about very it. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. 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 So something changed in your world significantly yeah. because yeah, you I, didn't stay in accounting no, for very no, long. No, no. It's a funny story. and um, I was going home on the tram from work uh, down New South Head Road. We live in the eastern suburbs. Of Sydney at that time, and uh, I saw three army guys in uniform because in those days, you know, they were encouraged to wear uniform on leave. Uh, probably didn't have anything else, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw these three guys on the tram, and they were having a great time. And they weren't misbehaving or anything; they were just giggling and carrying on and laughing. And I thought, they're having fun, you know. And here I am with my my Cobra hat on and my briefcase and my suit, grey suit, which was almost uniform. I looked like a more, I can't say that, I looked like a religious preacher, really. And uh, I saw these uh, young fellows. I think people recognise the, the type of dress that you talk talking yes, about there. Yeah. Yes. So I, uh, I saw these guys and I thought, geez, I'm going to have a crack at this. So I got off the tram at Rushcutters Bay, because I just left Sydney Tech, where I was doing my studies. And it was about three in the afternoon, I think, so these guys must have been on leave. So I got off the, uh, the tram at Rushcutters Bay, went straight, straight down to the recruiting depot, got the paperwork and took it home. And needless to say, um, people were not pleased. People as in Parents. family? Yes. <laughs> family yes. were yes. not pleased. <laughs> Uh, but uh, anyway. had your parents served in no, Germany, so no, they, no, they, they weren't no, no, in, that, no. in that conflict. No, I had, yeah. I had plenty of uh, family relatives that had served in Germany, yes. but my mother and father no. Yeah. But anyway, I uh, <coughs> um, they they approved and signed. And oh, they had to actually sign it yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I was under nineteen yes. at the time, and off they went, and then off I went to Kapuka to start my military odyssey. But almost going back. Where almost. I came from. In yes. fact, the first swimming carnival that we had there, um, I won. I was, I was a very keen swimmer. I won quite a few events, and uh, and uh, in fact, a lot of my schoolmates uh, came out to uh, to, Cheer you on. to know well to give me a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> why, why does that not surprise? Yeah, because the, the haircut the, the haircut that I had when I went into the army was a lot different to when I was in the army. Yeah, <laughs> just crew cut, you know. Almost Beatlemania yeah, time. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you went on and you served in the army. You served yep. in South Vietnam, and yep. you had quite an interesting military yep. career. Yeah. Um, I went uh, well one battalion uh, after core training, of course, and I always wanted to be infantry uh, because at the time I, I wanted to be SAS right from the outset, and for no other reason except I thought it would be fun. Seriously, at the time. It seems to be a recurring, recurring theme in your life, yes, Mike, that yeah. life's all about fun. Yeah, fun, and, and also I get easily bored, and when I'm bored I get into trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've, got to, I've got to keep myself, I've got to keep myself active, and I've got to, I must have an interest in something new all the time, and otherwise I just get bored and stale. We'll get on to what you're doing now that's keeping you interested, but I guess, to be fair, we should um, quickly just cap off your army career and you, know, you, you, you went to South Vietnam with, with one RAO? No, no, I, I went to, uh, I, I, firstly I got commissioned and uh, I went to um, uh, OCS Portsea, I was uh, commissioned in December uh, 65 um, and army made a big mistake, big man, not in commissioning, commissioning me I must say, but in terms of sending me back to Fire Battalion because Fire Battalion was half of one battalion. And I was in one, one battalion, Pentropic. Now, all the NCOs and diggers that I knew in terms of playing rugby and... Being one of the boys. Acting the goat and Railway Hotel in Liverpool and all sorts of escapades, they knew me. 
they knew the real me. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the one with a pip on the shoulder. So, so they, you, they, are, you, are you saying that that pip on the shoulder doesn't make you a real person, Mike? Uh, what, what, I, what I, must, what I, must, I must say now in retrospect, when I first graduated, I did have a massive OR complex. I was still basically an OR, but I had the rank. And I, but I learned the hard way, you know, I learned the hard way. And where I was very, very fortunate, uh, in Vietnam, they asked me to form the reconnaissance platoon. And all of the NCOs who volunteered and came were blokes that I played rugby with. And uh, they were, and, and the diggers were just a terrific bunch of blokes, fantastic. I, I couldn't have done the job, and we couldn't have been as, I think, su as successful without having that camaraderie and that, that teamwork around me of the blokes that I knew before I went away to Portsea. It's one thing to demand someone to do something and the other thing to have them do it for you. Yeah, and I, I think you've got to have a real love for your diggers and, and, and I think for the diggers have to have a real respect for you. And, you know, there are so many uh, qualities of leadership but I think the important ones of leadership is being fed income up and down the scale and also, more importantly, being absolutely, you know, the old favourite, fair, firm and friendly, you know? Very good. Okay, so what's Mike Von Berg doing with himself these days? Well, I mean, after I got out of the army, of course, I went overseas for many years. I mean, I had family interests overseas, and um, I was overseas for only 15 years. Um, lived in London, New York, uh, Vienna. Uh, um, what every ex-army officer does, obviously. No, yeah, well, <laughs> that's right, you know, especially when the firm pays. Um, Cape Town, uh, Nairobi, yeah, I had, a, I had a really good time in terms of the particular work I was doing at that time. And um, I'll never forget I was flying between Perth and Adelaide. Uh, and Adelaide was not my hometown, obviously, but I had to see someone there. And I was about 42 years of age and I was looking down at this vast expanse of country. And I had a major identity crisis. I really did, not in terms of uh, who I was or what I was doing, I had an identity crisis in terms of what nationality am I. German born, living in Vienna in Austria, children going to boarding school in England, doing most of my work on, in North America, now in Australia, Australian citizen, having served in Vietnam as an Australian, what the hell am I, you know? And I looked down and I thought, I've had a great time overseas, it's been exciting, but I'm coming home. And, and I, when I, uh, from there I flew off to the States and then back to London and then back to Vienna where I was living. And I made the decision at that time with my, my wife at the time and the kids were at school and I told them they were horrified. But I said, I've got to do it. I've got to go home. And it's the best move I ever made. I guess that's critical for everyone in life to identify their home. It is. To it effectively is be a war child roots. and exactly. giving up your blood in essence. It's exactly. an issue in Australian society today yeah. about where do people call home really in their exactly. hearts and, you know, and you've answered is, that. Well, my, you know, I mean, not being um, egotistical or blowing my own bags, I mean, we can trace our, our, our family back to 1100, accurately to 1400. That's I, almost a Charlemagne. I know, exactly, exactly. Uh, and related to the Byzantine emperors. Now, you know, I mean, I know where I come from, but it's not where I belong. That belonging is entirely different it is, from... It is, When you've, where, where, when where you've you lived in a place and, and, you know, I'm a bit of a knock-around sort of bloke and rugby and the boys and I love fishing and all those wonderful things, where the hell do you do that in Austria or in Germany or in Switzerland? I mean, you can do it, but it's not cheap. And also, you can't do it as readily and as freely as here. I mean, we have a wonderful lifestyle here. It's a great country. And I really had to make the move and come home. I mean, I know from time to time I try and get in touch with you. And it's impossible because you, you're out on the water fishing. <laughs> and it just, it, I, I just can't get to you. Yeah, you know? I've just got so, the, I'm <laughs> just feeling that tap, tap, tap <laughs> on the end of the line. <laughs> now, fishing is wonderful. And yep, it, yep. It, it's a great way to spend your time. Yeah. You're obviously doing a lot more than just fishing with your time oh, these yes. days. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm um, well, obviously now involved very heavily with the uh, Royal Australian Regiment Corporation, or association, but uh, a corporation. Uh, and, and I think uh, what happened was that um, there are two things in my life that's given me great joy. One, obviously, is Army, and the other one is Rugby. When I got to a certain age, I decided to put something um, back in. 
So I've been in, involved in rugby, right, I've coached state, um, still a level th I'm the right, oldest level three coach in Australia at 68 years of age. Since you don't look 68, Mike. Well, thank you very much, but uh, I feel it. <laughs> I feel it at times. <laughs> Mike, if you believe that, <laughs> good grief. <laughs> um, and the army's all, Army has been an important part of my life. And I thought, well, what can I put back into Army? And what sort of prompted me to get involved at, at if you like, an association administrative level was that uh, when I came back, I mean, we had a lot of reunions and just listening and talking to some of my, my ex-soldiers, I realised that in some, some quarters there were some, some issues and some problems that needed addressing. And a lot of them can't address it themselves, they've got to be helped. And I thought, well, the best way I can get in, uh, the best way I can help, if not on a one-on-one -on -one basis, is to actually get involved in an organisation that's passionate about helping ex-servicemen, and I don't mean just, uh, just old ex-servicemen, I mean the young people today that are in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places, uh, they've got the same problems as us. Nothing's changed. The equipment's changed, the theatre has changed, but the problems are the same. And you were talking about tracing your heritage back to the 1100s, I mean, people would know their history and know about um, the Battle of Waterloo with Napoleon and Wellington and yeah. soldiers on the battlefield in the 1800s and 1700s. Yeah. Um, Nothing has changed. Soldiering doesn't change. Nothing has changed. Yeah. I mean, uh, the more you read, sadly, the more you read of military history, the more you realise the same mistakes are being made over and over and over again. OK, Mike, so tell me, um, what are some of the things that you've been doing recently to start looking at some of the issues that you've been talking about? Um, well, I mean, one that uh, doesn't personally affect me is the CPI issue in terms of um, superannuation. Um, it doesn't affect me because I didn't do my 20 years. I mean, uh, you know, we had to part company and I did 12, 13 years yep. and I got the princely sum of $3,500. You know, <laughs> after, all those, shake. <laughs> after all those years and a handshake, not even a gold watch. But um, I, I look at some of my colleagues who have done a very loyal 20, 25, 30 years, and I, and I see their super being eroded because of this, well, antiquated system of measuring indexation. And the CPI is not a fair. Uh, fair indication, as we know, of cost of living. So what are some of the things that you've been actively doing to try and create a change? Oh, um, face to face with uh, MPs and Senators. Um, and I must admit, irrespective... Just in South Australia? Yes, yeah, mostly yeah. in South Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting place for politics in South Australia, and the beauty of it is it's, uh, it's fairly concentrated in Adelaide, not like Queensland you know, vast. Uh, but now I must say, but irrespective of the decision of the MPs, irrespective, I'm not going in terms of their opinions, but I must say from both sides of politics, three, three sides now of politics, um, I have had a fair hearing. I've had a fair hearing. I haven't been happy with the, with the result uh, or their, their decisions. I mean, the coalition has said quite clearly that they're going to... you've been to spending the time and you've been getting yeah, into their ears yeah, and... And, and, yeah, and, you know, sort of really making a bit of a, a pest of myself, you know. I'm a great believer in the squeaky door, you know, and if you just keep squeaking that door, you'll get some oil one day. So you see yourself as a squeaky door these days? You're there Well, no, I mean, when, when I was heard? In the, no, when I was in the army, I was a bit of a pest. <laughs> and, so you're not a serial and, pest, that's... Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to think I'm still a bit of a pest, but uh, with a lot more maturity and uh, a lot more... Uh, a lot more cooth in the way you go about yeah, things bit, today. Yeah, bit, a bit more... I try to be a bit more professional. Yeah. Uh, you can be upfront and still be professional. And most importantly, you can still be decent in, in the approaches that you make. No matter how passionate you feel about something, uh, you can't be aggro. I mean, some of these blokes on the on the emails in terms of cyber attacks on people, uh, I just find deplorable, and it doesn't get them anywhere. You know, I'd rather I'd rather be firm in terms of, um, if you like, my opinion, pushing a point, but at the same time you're polite, and you're humble, and you you you, you basically, um, I suppose, um, treating the other person how you would like to be treated. So. You I, I can hear that you've got an issue with the way that some people conduct themselves and it's 
to use the vernacular, playing the man yes. rather, rather than playing the game. There, there is that aspect. And the other aspect is that um, governments, any governments of the day, are masters of divide and conquer. They are masters of divide and conquer. Now, we I think it's called politics? It's, it's called politics. It's called really playing smart, you know? Smart politics. Yeah. yeah. And, and here in Australia, we have a, a plethora of, of well-meaning ESOs, ex-service organisations, all well-meaning, etc. But when, they, when there is no cohesion and when potentially they're seen to be fighting amongst themselves about the same issue, I mean, that is a classic for politics to, to just fragment the whole issue. Whereas if we can pull them all together in some coordinated sort of way without them losing, if you like, their own position or authority or whatever, you know, because you don't want to sort of step on toes in terms of egos, but at least if we can all talk with one or two voices, well then I think the issue is resolved. Now, here the RSL, sadly, uh, I mean, I'm not anti-RSL, uh, but sadly the RSL, I think, has been missing in action when it comes to some of these issues. Now, in, def in defending that statement, they may be um, doing things behind closed doors. and, and You can't see that. You can't see it. It's yeah. not public. So therefore, uh, we can only perceive at our level, and I'm a member of an RSL, we can only perceive at our level that maybe nothing is happening. And I think the communication from the RSL is inadequate and they should brief their members more as to what they are actually doing in relation to some of these issues. A lot of what we've been talking about has been communication, really. And oh, it's all communication. Yeah. It is all communication. And, and uh, sadly, I think today, with, um, well, with the fantastic media that we have, including this contraption here, uh, there is no excuse. There is no excuse for not communicating an issue or there is no excuse in terms of communicating what you're trying to do to help people. And I mean, you know, if people know that something's happening, there's less dissent in the ranks. If they don't know what's happening, they say, what the hell's going on, you know? In the absence of the truth, people create their own story, I think is the old Abs saying. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. So, you know, we're just trying to, if you like, not usurp any ESO or anything else, we're just trying to fill a gap. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Mike, because you've said something that's picked my ear up and I'm sure a lot of the listeners heard what you said. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're really talking about here is how we actually get some real positive outcomes mm -hmm. through the work that you're doing in society. You used the word egos. Mm -hmm. You said that one of the problems with forming an alliance of ESOs is not tramping on egos. Mm -hmm. um, how do we actually get people working together from all these organisations understanding that egos are an issue? Egos will always be an issue. There's no question about it. They will always be an issue. It's how you massage those egos. And look, I've been in business long enough to know. I mean, I used to say to myself, um, I don't want to do business with people I don't like. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> if you want that check, if you want that check signed, you know, you've got to do business sometimes with people that you may not. Be you wouldn't have a beer with them. Yeah, and socially or dinner, or, or you know, yeah. or you, you may not yeah. take them fishing. I think there's a huge difference between people you detest yeah. and won't do business with, yeah. and the people that hey, this is not going to be my close circle of yeah. social yeah. acquaintances. I mean, there are some people you would never do business with because you probably never would see the check. But there are other people where you think, oh, I don't really like this bloke, or there's something about him, or whatever, or them, or this organisation. Uh, but you know, you've got to, you've got to basically uh, manoeuvre your way through that, and forget about your own sometimes gut feelings, and just keep going and deal with it until you've got. You may not have total trust, but you've got a bit of respect on both sides, and you get the deal done. I mean, it comes back to communicating and appealing to people's common sense that, look, if we do work together, there might be a bit of a good outcome here. OK, let's move on to a different tact. We talked very briefly about military superannuation. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I talk to a lot of people in the service community, mm -hmm. and you hear a lot of different things that concern them. Yep. What, what do you see as the main Oh, priorities yeah, with what yeah. people are actually having their concerns over? Well, 
I, I, in, in some of the roles that I do, I mean, I'm very much involved now in talking to uh, young people for uh, selection to recon platoon, recon sniper platoon. Um, Whereabouts is that? Uh, that's in, well, 7 Battalion, uh, 1 Battalion, 2 Battalion. I'm going up to Inf Centre uh, on Thursday to do a presentation to the patrol commander's course up there. Um, and I, I, just, I just admire all those young people that are really trying very hard to better themselves and to be better soldiers. But um, the, the thing that keeps coming back to me all the time, and in particular um, units that have recently come back from Afghanistan, the issue is mental health. And, you know, in, in my day, we had no idea what PTSD was. You know, we had, and sadly, I mean, when you sort of look at I love the History Channel, you know, uh, and when you when you look at some of those wonderful programs on the History Channel, and you look at what they did to soldiers in the First World War that obviously were suffering from PTSD, shot them. they shot them. Now that is just tragic, and in particular for the relatives of those poor souls. But now, you know, we have young soldiers coming back with. The, the same problem. Now, we don't shoot them, but we tend to ignore them. I think we should just clarify for everybody that after the Boer War in South Africa and the Break of Morant yep. saga with the British Army, yep. um, Australian soldiers are no longer subject to British military authority, yep. and no Australian soldiers were actually shot. No. For no, no. those issues at all no, in the no. First World War. Just, just, just so yeah, everybody's yeah. Oh, clear no, on no. that But they were in Britain. Absolutely. You know, and they were on the Western Front. So, you know, it, it's just sad. And, and the soldiers of today have the, have the similar problems. And, and sadly, there is this, um, this stigma that's associated with mental health where, you know, if you say, look, oh, I'm just not right at the moment, and they think that it's a sign of weakness, they think that their promotion aspects will be jeopardised, uh, they think they'll be posted out of the unit. I mean, it, it is a scary situation, and it has to be addressed. And I know Army is trying to address it. I know DVA is trying to address it. We are, t we are addressing it ourselves as an association through Trojan's Trek in South Australia. But we just have to do more, and, and we and and by doing more, I, I don't mean psychiatrists and pills, because that's just the money train and the gravy train for some people. It means some one-on-one -on -one counselling from at the unit level, through section commanders, platoon commanders, company commanders, to teach them to have a better understanding of mental health issues. And they're, they're things that I find at the moment very, very important because with our commitment in Afghanistan, with the tempo of our training, with the rotations, I mean, I know one young man that's had seven rotations. I mean, it's extraordinary pressure on the family, but at the same time, extraordinary stress, stress sorry, on the soldier in the, in the uh, operational area. For sure. Mike, the floor is yours. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about with some of the problems that you're identifying? Um, throughout the community at the moment? Well, I guess one is the community at large. And, you know, soldiering um, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, was a noble profession. It was a noble profession. If you were a soldier, it, you know, even at the lowest rank, it didn't have to be a four-star general, even at the lowest rank, it was a noble, noble profession. I think in today's society, because of some of the um, more what I would call limp-wristed left, uh, left um, influences, um, the, the profession of arms is less appreciated for what it is and what it does for the community and the nation at large. Okay. And I think there needs to be a, a, a proper education process at school level to start to take the military away from what is perceived to be just a job. That's intriguing considering how we started this interview that the young Mike von Berg had no interest in history. Yeah, and now, right. we're, now we're seeing the wheel turn oh, where exactly. the importance is so, exactly. so high. I mean, you know, I go up bush quite a bit, the Blimmin range, uh, Blimmin and, uh, sorry, the Flinders ranges, and uh, I, I love walking around old cemeteries. You know, and I'm not a sicko. I mean, I just a lot, lot of history and history, heritage, history. absolutely. And you're looking, oh, poor bloke, and, and you know, a child that's obviously died of diphtheria or something, and it's just history that's everywhere. I'll give you a good example of that in my hometown, um, 
Tuong Cemetery is the oldest cemetery in Brisbane and yep. the first ever recipient of a Victoria Cross awarded to a colonial soldier is buried in Tuong Cemetery. Well, there's history. That's phenomenal. And military history at yeah. that. You know. yeah. Yeah. But anyway, today's about you, my friend. No, no that's yeah. all right. No, so I, I think um, we need to um, have some sort of an education program as to the, the profession of arms. And I mean, of service, you know. So is, what we're talking about here is how we actually implement some of the change that you're looking for, not just in society, but throughout the system. Yeah. And you're talking there about education. Do you see the, the need for dedicated educational programs or for education to be incorporated into the current curriculum that's yeah. appropriate? Yeah, we've got, uh, in, in our association in South Australia, we've got a guy called Ken Duthie, who's an ex-Warren officer, class one. And he, he, the work that he does with schools is extraordinary. I mean, he's got a van full of uh, military memorabilia. He takes it to schools, he hangs it up, he's got all the stuff laid out, and he has, you know, literally hundreds of kids, and from all ages, and he basically talks about the military. And he doesn't just talk about the army, he talks about the navy, the air force, in terms of within his uh, knowledge base. But, you know, it's, it's that sort of, it's the tribal elders getting in and talking to schools. I mean, uh, I go to speak to many schools about Anzac Day and what it means to me, you know. And I think that's the sort of education, not, and it's not what I would call top down, like what they tried to do to me at Christian Brothers in terms of Australian history. Built it into you. Yeah, it's got to be something exciting and different from the outside where you break up, if you like, the monotony of school and. It becomes have, personal. Yeah, and you know, and a one on one with, uh, you know, and I mean, the question you're always asked, you know, Mr. Von Berger, do you kill anybody? You know, and say, well, we're not here to talk about that. Let's, you know, uh, but but they're little kids that ask that question, not big and kids. And it's innocent. Oh yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. But I think that sort of educational process of uh, you know old old farts like us going in and talking to kids and 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 showing the face of the military that that is that is, that is human, uh, that is caring that is understanding and has a rapport with young people. I know another tribal elder in the community does a similar thing and he actually passes that knowledge physically by taking a poppy to give to every school That's kid that right. he talks to and he's passing the knowledge by yep. giving the poppy and, yep. yeah, and it's just a remembrance point. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's that um, the community at large, I, I don't think, respects the military enough. And, and that, that is sad when you look at the families that have suffered through soldiers' commitments. Okay, well, you're pretty busy in everything that you're doing and it's noble to contribute. Uh, what is it that you'd like Mike von Berg to actually be remembered for in the defence community as what your contribution was? Um, oh, gosh. I'd like, I'd like to think that uh, I was a pretty good platoon commander um, and I would like to think that um, no matter at what level of rank I operated at, and as I say, I was um, SAS, commandos, all that stuff, adjutant of my battalion and all that, um, I would like to think that um, I've always sort of given people a fair go and, and always been prepared to listen um, not always prepared to take advice, <laughs> <laughs> because there is there is a thing which is called poor advice. Yes, you know. Uh, but I think giving people a fair go in terms of in the service, now out of the service, um, uh, whilst I'm still breathing and reasonably healthy, and thanks to your observation, still looking reasonably reasonably young, uh, I'd like to sort of just really try and rally the troops through the help of the wonderful people we've got within our organisation to make our presence known in terms of some of these issues that soldiers of today uh, are going to be going through. Mike Von Berg, MC, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time today. Thank you.